Hello, thank you for stopping by. My name is Becky and this is Bex Reads and today I'm here to share with you my final weekly reads for the month of May. So I forgot the dates again so it's everything I read between these dates. <laughs> So I was surprised with how many books I managed to get read within that time span, so let's just get into it so I have less to edit. So the first book that I finished reading was Island Witch, and this was the Black Cat Book Coven book pick for the month of May. We will be having a live show tonight, the 29th, if I manage to get this video edited and posted by then. But if not, if it's past the 29th, I will link it down in the description as well. And that will be on my channel at 7 p.m. EST. This is classified as a historical horror and it is inspired by Sri Lankan folklore. So it did help me cross off another country on my Read Around the World challenge. So I'm happy about that. But in this, we are following Amara, who is the daughter of the local demon priest. And her father has always been really respected as a demon priest until her island gets colonized and Christianity moves in to their island. And suddenly everybody is dismissing her father and accusing her and her father of witchcraft and demon worshipping. And when a bunch of young men start getting attacked on this island... Amara is insisting to the people that it is a local folklore creature legend that is doing it, but nobody's taking her seriously because they think she's she and her father are doing it because of witchcraft and demon worshipping. Um, but they soon find out that whatever they believe, it's not helping with the problem, people are still being killed. It leads to her really embracing more of that folklore legend that she grew up with. It leads to her discovering some secrets about her father and her family life, and it's kind of a revenge story. So I'm not gonna share all my thoughts on this because we will be doing that live show, so check that out and you can hear mine as well as anybody else's thoughts who finished it. But I will say this was just an okay book for me. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. It was just so-so. The next book I finished is The Dragon Who Loved Me. And this is book five in the Dragonkin series. So I am making progress in a series. I didn't finish the series, but I made progress in it. And this was a reread for me. This is about Rona, who is the daughter of a warrior dragoness and a forger father. And so she's grown up to be a warrior herself. And she's really good at it, too. However, her heart is more in line with her father's calling of being a forger. She wants to deal with weapons. But she gets sent out on this mission to go and find Queen Alwyn, who has gone missing, and... Find her before enemy people can find her and kill her. So she sets out on this mission with the help of Vigholf, I think that's how you say his name, who is a Northland dragon who isn't somebody that she's overly friendly with. Um, the Northland dragons and Rona's clan are very, eh, they butt heads a lot. But he very much respects her. He knows that she's a great warrior and he is always encouraging her to be the best she can be and help her in any way and he's there to like guard her back because he secretly knows that she is who it is meant to be for him. This on reread I understand why I didn't keep the physical book for this one because this was just okay. This wasn't anything great for me. I loved seeing Rona's relationship with her father. It was very sweet. I loved seeing the children of the couples from the previous books actually age and grow up. I also love, once again, that this book has POVs from not just our main characters, but all the characters that we've seen from previous books. It's also still just a very lighthearted fantasy romance that has dragon shifters, which I also enjoy. I didn't love the audio narration of this one because the narrator was switched in this book compared to the last three books who had a different audio narrator, and I loved that audio narrator. I, I honestly don't know who it was. I just know it was different. But she didn't really inflict her voice as well as the first narrator. So I didn't love that. I also just didn't feel the strongest chemistry between Rona and Vigholf. They were fine, but it just wasn't there for me. The next book I read, though, was probably the best book that I have read so far this year. 
and it's not even released yet. It is an ARC, and it comes out on June 4th, so maybe I can talk you into checking this one out, because it is a great one. And that is In the Hour of Crows, so I got an ARC of this through NetGalley, which I very much enjoyed. All I really knew about this going in was I liked this cover and it had to do with a woman who could talk the death out of people, which I thought sounded very witchy, which is what appealed to me. This is the story of Weatherly, who has the ability to talk the death out of people. She is a death talker. And she's had this ability since she was a child. And when her mother abandons her, her abusive grandmother ends up raising her. And her grandmother also has some, like, pagan witchy vibes to her she is able to create spells and potions for people and she uses weatherly's ability to talk the death out of people for her own gain and when things go wrong she punishes weatherly her cousin is also able to see the future so she comes from a family that has a lot of witchy ways about them and when she gets older her cousin is murdered, and her cousin has left behind this very cryptic clue as to what she was doing the day that she was murdered. And it has something to do with Weatherly's family. So, in this story, we are following Weatherly as she is trying to piece together the clues that her cousin has left for her. Meanwhile, trying not to call attention from the local police, who didn't really look into her cousin's death all that much, who don't really take Weatherly's and her family seriously. They only want her when she is able to bring somebody from the brink of death. Otherwise, they see her as a pariah. So she's trying to avoid attracting the attention of the police. She's also trying to do this under the radar of her grandmother because her grandmother is keeping secrets from her and keeping things from her that could help her discover the truth of what her cousin was leading to. She's also discovering some family secrets along the way. And she's doing this with the help of this young man named Rook, who is sometimes a crow. And they have a very strong and meaningful connection as well. This is just a story of family, of grief and how people express and acknowledge grief and letting go in life. That's basically the main theme of this story. This book I could not put down. It hooked me from the very beginning. It starts with this very tense scene that really sets the tone for what Weatherly has to deal with growing up with her grandmother. I loved the family dynamics in here and I'm not usually one for like a lot of family drama but the secrets that were unfolding within this and how it was pieced together just captivated my attention. So maybe I need to stop saying that family drama isn't for me because you'll say that apparently family dramas work for me. <laughs> I loved the tiny magical realism element that is in here because it kept me guessing of is what she is witnessing true or is this a product of her grief? I I wasn't ever sure I wanted it to be true. I cried at the end of this book because of how it explored grief and loss and how people deal with that and how people learn to let go of that and how they move on with life. It was just, it was very, very heart tugging. It really, I want to say this is probably the first book this year that has really just made me sob. And the epilogue of this book just gave me what I wanted. It gave me the ending that I wanted for this story because I, I wanted it to end in a certain way and at a certain point in this book I didn't think it was going to. I was like, well damn, that's not how I wanted this story to end. And then I got to the epilogue and it, it gave me what I wanted. It wasn't a cliche epilogue. It didn't end with like a baby or a marriage or anything like that. So I will put that out there because I know a lot of people don't like epilogues. But I really, this just, this satisfied me. And it was just such an emotional and enthralling read for me. And it just, it gave me those witchy vibes that you guys know I love. And it gave me those gothic vibes as well, and this book was just amazing. So if you are somebody who likes a little, like, paranormal family drama murder mystery, you should check this out.
I also managed to complete another series or duology this month, so I'm very happy and proud of myself for that. And it was a duology that I said last year if I didn't start it and finish it this year that I was going to DNF it. And so I did. I went back and I reread the first book and then I went on to the second book and I got this series taken care of. The first book is A Touch of Gold and the second book is A Curse of Gold. So this is a YA fantasy that is the story of King Midas's daughter. So we follow Cora, who is the cursed daughter of King Midas. He touched her when she was a child and it turned her, like she's not solid gold, she's just she, think of Oren from The Plated Prisoner. That's this girl. She's gold everywhere. And so she has grown up in isolation because she also has the ability to turn things to gold herself. But she needs to have access to gold to do it. So the palace has been swept of everything gold that she could touch, that she could manipulate into turning other things gold. Um, she is able to sense the few objects that her father originally turned in gold as well because she was one of them. So her father has this connection with his original gold pieces that he has to be around them. Otherwise, he starts to be weakened to the point of death. And one day, his gold gets stolen. And so he's on the brink of dying and she can sense where this gold is. She can like sense what direction it's in. So she sets out on this journey to try and track down the missing gold pieces to bring them back to her father with the help of this ship captain who she was introduced to as a possible suitor. And when she gets on his ship, she learns that he may not be the nice upstanding guy that he pretended to be. And he is leading her to a very dangerous situation. And then in the second book, it is her story of how she's trying to break this curse on her father. So in the first book, she's trying to track down the treasure to bring it back to him so that way he doesn't die. But in the second book, she's continuing her journey because she doesn't just want to find her father's treasure. She wants to find the man who cursed her father, who I think is Dionysus, if I remember correctly. And he lives on this floating island that appears and disappears. It's very hard for gods to even find this island, let alone humans. But she manages to get the help of another god to track down this island to find him to try and break the curse on her father. So this was a book that I really enjoyed the first time I read it. Um, I gave it like four stars the first time I read it. And on reread, I pretty much stayed the same. I really liked the seafaring adventure. I liked the story of Midas's daughter because that had never been something I have read before or ever. Um, that remains true. Like I've read, you know, of course, the Played Prisoner series, which is a King Midas retelling, but this is about King Midas's daughter. I loved the treasure hunt aspect of this. I loved the found family of the people that she becomes close with on this ship. The second book gave me very much, if you have ever watched Aladdin and the King of Thieves, like that island that's on the back of a turtle, that's what the second book gave me vibes of. It's they're trying to hunt down this island that moves and disappears and people can't find it. It is one that if you are a young YA reader, I definitely would recommend it because it has absolutely no spice in it, but it does have a romance in it. But I think it's a very sweet, very innocent, adventurous story that young YA readers and up could enjoy if that's your thing. And then the last book that I read, which is where you will see that family dramas do in fact apparently appeal to me, I read Romancing Mr. Bridgerton. Book four of the Bridgerton series, I think. So I have never had any desire to read this series, like no desire at all. I've always said that high society, rich people, family drama just does not appeal to me. And this being set in the Regency era, that really didn't appeal to me because I just don't care about Regency era. But I uh, learned that this was a friends to lovers romance. And so I watched the TV show first. And I did watch this TV show backwards. I started with season three, then I went to season two, then I watched Queen Charlotte, then I watched season one. Um, 
And I got hooked into Colin and Penelope's story. I loved their characters. I loved their romance. I thought they had great chemistry. And so once I was done with the four episodes, because they split it, which is just rude. Um, once I got done with their four episodes, I wanted to, like, go back and see what happened in the previous episodes. To see, like, their arc, you know? And so I got really sucked into this damn Bridgerton show. And I still wasn't like, oh yeah, now I want to read these books. But I thought, you know what? If I can find this on, like, through my library or something, I, I'll listen to this fourth book because it's Colin and Penelope's story. And I wanted to see, like, how it differs from the show. So I did. I found it on Hoopla, so I was able to get it right away. And I listened to the audiobook, and this was so boring. <laughs> I am obsessed with this show now. I binged it in two days. I loved these characters. However, this book was so damn boring. I was listening to it, I swear I fell asleep. It just didn't convey the chemistry and the emotions that the characters on the show portray for me. Like, I did not get that sense of attraction between Colin and Penelope that I got from the show. Uh, they felt very much like, I use this euphemism all the time, but they have the chemistry of some soggy cardboard. And some people might say, oh, that's because you didn't read the three books leading up to it, so you didn't get that buildup of their relationship. But listen, I didn't watch the first two episodes of the TV show either, and I still fell in love with their characters just from watching season three. Season three was what made me want to go back and see their storyline arc from the beginning, and I actually watched it backwards. <laughs> so I watched it regress instead of progress. But... That apparently isn't the problem because I was able to connect with their characters and fall in love with their characters on the show. Meanwhile, the book was just not good. <laughs> the audio narration was god-awful, so I don't recommend that. Um, the way the characters talk to each other just didn't give me, like, a romantic vibe. It just felt like two strangers talking to each other. Nothing they did was overly romantic, in my opinion. Like, I, I didn't get, like, the hand touches and the pining that I saw in the show. I just did not feel that with these characters. But I did like the friends to lovers aspect of it because, you know, I, I'm never not going to love a friends to lovers. So I liked that. I liked that Penelope stood up for herself and she wasn't willing to give up something to allow somebody else to take credit for it. And I liked that, you know, once he found out that she was Lady Whistledown, if you're somebody who gets upset by spoilers, I don't know what to tell you. You're in the wrong place. He was upset, but he got over it really quickly, um, and it wasn't something that, like, broke them up or anything like that. So, there were things I liked about it, but overall, it was just god-awful boring. The smut scenes in this book were cringy as fuck. <laughs> oh, I was just like, ew. Whereas, in the show... I was like, give me more. So if you're interested in reading these books, okay, I guess, give it a try. Um, but I would say if all you ever do is watch the show, you'll be good. You'll be good and the show is 10 times better than these books. And I will not be continuing on with this series because there is no couple that I am invested in as much as I was Colin and Penelope. And the books were just not good. And I give, like, the producers and the directors and the writers of this show immense credit. Because I don't know how you could read these books and be like, ah, yeah, let's make that into a show. Because I feel like there are so many better books that you could make into a show. But what they chose to do with it, as far as, like, Penelope and Colin's story, because, let's face it, I'm not going to read the others to see how they differ, but if they are as drastically different from the book, 
props to them for making a compelling show that I had no interest in watching, but somehow hooked me into binging it within a matter of two and a half days. Um, that made me actually pay money for a Netflix subscription just so I could watch this show. Because I, I've never had streaming services. Like, the one time I've had Netflix was back when you mailed them DVDs in the mail. That's how old I am, folks. That was when I used Netflix. <laughs> I have never had a Netflix account since they've been a streaming service. Okay? I've borrowed other people's Netflix, but I've never paid for it. So for a show to make me want to even invest in paying for a subscription to watch it, uh, br props to you. Props to you. Because if I had just read these books, I would have been like, uh, nah, nah, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, but the show made me want to read the book, and I'm glad that I watched the show because the show is what I recommend. So, there's that. But those are the books that I finished out the month reading. Let me know down in the comments if you've read any of these and what your thoughts are. But if you don't want to comment that but would like to let me know that you made it to the end of this, could you leave me a... Leave me a mirror emoji. Okay, so with that, thank you so much for watching, and until my next video, let's get started on thinking about June reading. Bye!